from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. At the legislature today, many members of the House of Delegates are attorneys, realtors, accountants, and other professionals that require a state license. A piece of legislation today affected them directly, so they stood up to be counted. We'll explain why. The Coal Association endorsed a higher tax on coal to clean up water around abandoned mine sites. And we'll discuss new federal laws concerning what you need to get a driver's license coming up tonight on the legislature today. And good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. There is nothing in state law about graffiti. Under a bill passing the Senate today, graffiti means any unauthorized inscription, word, figure, or design that is marked, etched, scratched, drawn, painted on, or affixed to the public or private property of another, which defaces it. Penalties and fines depend on the amount of damage done to the building. It was one of 10 bills passing Senate scrutiny today and moving on to the House of Delegates. Senate Bill 75 says no one can operate an equine rescue facility without first obtaining a license from the State Department of Agriculture. The license costs $100. When applying, local animal control officials will inspect the facility. Senator John Unger said the new law is really needed. We've had some situations here in West Virginia where um, individuals have called themselves a, an animal rescue facility, uh, particularly with horses. They receive donations uh, under the auspices of that premise, uh, but then those donations were diverted to personal expenses, and actually later on, uh, officials had to rescue the horses. Many of them have died because of starvation and other things. What this will do is make sure that those facilities that are calling themselves rescue facilities, particularly for horses, are actually spending their money in the care and uptake for those animals and not starving them to death in order to enrich their own lives and buy cars, clothing, and other things. This happened in Berkeley County, and I understand it's been happening in other parts of the state. So, Mr. President, I'd urge the adoption of this legislation. The state will save more money under Senate Bill 390, one of Governor Tomlin's measures. Senate Finance Chairman Roman Prezioso explained the bill does two things. It will provide funding for infrastructure modernization and for the state's ever-increasing Medicaid expenses. The second part of the bill deals with Rainy Day Part B. And um, what the governor wants to do here is the interest earned on Rainy Day Part B uh, will be dedicated to the uh, support of the Medicaid program, which you well know next year there's going to be about a $200 million deficit in Medicaid, so that'll create only $8.5 million, and you can tell we have a way to go to fill that gap. And Senate Bill 408 creates a criminal offense for intentionally defacing private or public property with graffiti. Senator Evan Jenkins says that while cities can regulate this nuisance street art through an ordinance, there is nothing in state code addressing it. He said graffiti is becoming a problem in Wayne and Cabell counties. Jenkins wanted to make sure the bill's language was strong enough. One of the things that's not in this bill as it was presented originally was the issue of uh, restitution to the property owner. And again, working with your counsel, it's my understanding, just want to uh, confirm, although uh, restitution of the property owner is not in this bill, that is covered elsewhere in the code, and a court can order that uh, uh, even though it's not specifically in this bill? That is correct. Because okay. clearly property owners that have had their property defaced want it cleaned up, there's expense associated with it, so the court can direct restitution, the property owner can get payment for the cleanup of their property. Absolutely. Secondly, obviously this um, uh, real move towards community service, and this bill originally had some components in it uh, uh, authorizing uh, the opportunity to uh, send for community service to people who uh, convict this uh, or are convicted of this crime. Uh, although that provision is taken out, I also understand that there's community service allowable under other statutory provisions, so it wasn't necessary to put it in here. Is that correct? That is also correct. 
Nine of today's bills on third reading passed unanimously. Senate Bill 379 that authorized the State Nursing Board to designate a treatment program for nurses with alcohol, drug, and emotional problems received one no vote. They now head over to the House. The Senate Energy, Industry and Mining Committee today approved a tax increase on coal. The increase is necessary to pay for water reclamation at abandoned mines. Senate Bill 579 raises the tax more than 90 percent from 14.4 cents per ton to 27.9 cents per ton. The tax is applied after the coal is cleaned of rocks and other debris. Bill Rainey with the West Virginia Coal Association supports the increase, but says it comes at a bad time for the coal industry. Couldn't be a worse time perhaps in the industry to do this, but we nevertheless need to do it. But what special reclamation tax does is it takes care of the uh, forfeited areas. When uh, permits are forfeited because a, an operator has not performed up to the standard and there is a differential in the bond that is posted and what it costs to clean that area up, then this special reclamation fund takes, uh, takes that up. And it's always been an industry funded uh, project. It, it maintains its, co it coincides with our bonding program and we're able to maintain control of that as it, as it regards. And this comes out of an actuarial study that was done by the Advisory Council as well as DEP that indicates that this is the increase that is needed to sustain this program uh, for a long number of years or into perpetuity. What, what percentage of this would you say would be spent on underground mines versus surface mines? Is this mainly a surface mine? Uh, uh, no, sir, issue? it's both. Both. It's both because it includes water treatment, and, uh, and water treatment is, is the larger chunk of the liability, as you might suspect. Uh, but it, it covers all operations, uh, even preparation plants that have been stepped away from. So the forfeitures are, are diminishing. Uh, you know, after we got through the first initial stages of this whole program, you had a number of them, and now we're seeing that number diminish. So we're hopeful that that's uh, going to continue. The tax proceeds go to the Department of Environmental Protection for the Special Reclamation Fund and the Special Reclamation Water Trust Fund. The bill now heads to the Senate Finance Committee. The House of Delegates passed six bills today. As Adam Cavalier reports, the bills passed without debate, but that doesn't mean there weren't some questions. If you purchase a property that has residential tenants living in it, you'll have to give those tenants time to vacate the premises. House Judiciary Chair Tim Miley says this applies to property purchased at a foreclosure sale. You have to give them at least 90, if they're subject to a month-to-month -month lease, you have to give them a month's notice before you as a new purchaser can evict them. And if they are subject to a, a longer lease, you have to give them either at least 90 days or 30 days prior to the end of the lease, whichever is shorter. While that may sound confusing, let me explain. If there's six months remaining on that lease, you have to give them 90 days notice. Let's say there's 45 days remaining on the lease, you have to give them at least 30 days prior to the end of their lease. And the rationale behind that is, is, is that um, there was no expectation that at the end of the lease they had any guarantee that it would be renewed anyway. Their lease was going to terminate. While House Bill 3177 passed without debate, House Minority Leader Tim Armstead questioned how commercial establishments would be affected. I know this, that the property itself relates to uh, rental properties, residential rental properties, but if there is a lease in the same building or on the same property, say for a commercial business, or if there's a lease, uh, you know, a mineral lease, a coal lease, oil and gas lease, would this affect how those are, I know the notice would still, I assume, go to them. How would it affect how their rights would be, uh, would be moving forward after the sale? With the example we talked about where there's a building that may have a commercial establishment on the first floor and residential rental apartments on the second, third, and fourth floors, for example. Um, this uh, pertains only to those residential rental apartments. It does not provide any relief for the commercial establishment. However, though, keep in mind that if the bill doesn't pass, the residential, or excuse me, the corporate establishment that's being rented, it, it doesn't have any fewer rights because they can be evicted immediately anyway under the current law. That bill passed 97 to 2. House Bill 4104 caused a stir, not because of its content, but because of how many legislators it would affect. Campbell County Delegate Jim Morgan says the bill would allow professional licensing boards 
to exempt certain licensees from continuing education requirements. The exemption would apply to licensees with a total of 20 years of practice, whether or not the 20 years were continuous or interrupted, and whether or not the practice was in West Virginia or another state, provided that the practice was in a state with substantially similar requirements to ours. I repeat, it is permissive, and I would urge passage. I've been practicing law for 32 years, so I think if they would pass such a rule, it would definitely affect me. Uh, would other members who are members of professional organizations that think they may be affected by this, please stand. Speaker Rick Thompson ruled that those standing were members of a class and would have to vote on the bill, which passed unanimously. House Bill 4345 aims to prevent scrap metal theft from railroad yards. Miley says the bill does so by providing specific circumstances for someone to be able to sell the metal. The sale can only be made by an authorized representative of the railroad company. It must be in an amount greater than one ton, and it must be accompanied by a written bill of sale or other writing evidencing the sale. If uh, these uh, requirements are followed, then the purchaser is considered a valid purchaser, a bona fide purchaser. The scrap metal bill made it through 99 to 1, while House Bill 4390 went through unanimously to create a Uniform Power of Attorney Act. It automatically revokes a divorced spouse's authority as agent. That was some, uh, those are some questions that asked in our committee, that once the filing for divorce is made, the power of attorney is revoked. And that can be of concern, obviously, if you and your spouse aren't getting along, and you probably aren't if you're getting divorced. But in any event, um, the purpose of this bill is, quite frankly, to provide a uniform standard that can be followed and portable to all other states who adopt the same provisions. I urge passage of the bill. All of these bills move on to the Senate. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Adam Cavalier in Charleston. The House Committee on Banking and Insurance considered three bills today, one of which prohibits insurance companies from discriminating against certain health care providers. Ohio County Democrat Ryan Ferns is the lead sponsor on House Bill 4468. He says it stems from complaints from physical therapists. The physical therapy profession is finding that, and just beginning to, to see, in certain cases, insurance companies are denying altogether reimbursement for physical therapist assistance services. So it has nothing to do with rates. You know, it's just the fact that, that they're saying we will only reimburse you for services provided by a physical therapist. So we wanted to make sure that, that, that licensed assistants and anyone who's a licensed assistant in the state who's operating within their scope of practice will be reimbursed for their services. Ferns is a physical therapist himself. He emphasized several times to his colleagues that the bill has nothing to do with rates and just creates an exemption so that assistants can get paid. You'll need new documents to prove who you are when you renew your driver's license. We'll go over that and other issues related to the Vi Division of Motor Vehicles in just a moment. First, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today and what's coming up in the Senate tomorrow. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 590, to add adult siblings of an adoptee as an individual who can place his or her name on the Voluntary Adoption Registry, recognizing that some adults who were adopted as children have a strong desire to obtain identifying information about their natural siblings. Senate Bill 591, to impose a penalty on unemployment compensation recipients for obtaining benefits through the use of fraudulent statements or actions. Senate Bill 593, to establish the Office of Child Advocacy as an independent agency to monitor the Division of Child Protective Services and Division of Juvenile Services. Senate Bill 594, to allow educators who teach West Virginia studies to be provided two days of professional leave to attend a conference within the state on the history, culture, and literature of West Virginia during the sesquicentennial celebration in 2013. Senate Bill 601, to modify jury service requirements by creating exceptions excusing women who are breastfeeding from jury duty upon request and requiring reasonable accommodations for a breastfeeding juror if she chooses to serve. And Senate Bill 606, to create a procedure for forfeiture of items related to child pornography arrests and other computer crimes and prosecutions.
Only one bill up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, Senate Bill 214, to clarify that a sunrise review is required for the establishment, revision, or expansion of a professional scope of practice. Among the bills on second reading, Senate Bill 410, to make West Virginia law consistent with federal law on withholding of personal income tax on gambling winnings. Senate Bill 421, creating the Captive Servid Farming Act to allow deer farms to sell venison. Senate Bill 477, to prohibit the possession of wild and exotic animals. Senate Bill 499, to expressly exempt the Public Employees Insurance Agency, or any plan established by PEIA, from the requirements of the State Insurance Code, except where those provisions are made expressly applicable to the Public Employees Insurance Agency. And Senate Bill 527, to revise the antiquated stock laws of West Virginia. The Real ID Act of 2005 is a federal law, not a state law. It affects what documents you'll need to take with you to your local DMV to renew your driver's license. We thought it would be a good time to go over all of that and discuss DMV issues before the West Virginia Legislature. Joining us is Natalie Harvey, Public Information Director with the Division of Motor Vehicles. Welcome. So Thank glad you, you're ben. here. Thank you. Now, I have to say, I knew this was coming. We knew Real ID passed in 2005, and we knew this was coming, but I have to say, when I saw the list of things that I'm going to have to bring when I renew my driver's license, I got to tell you, it's a little intimidating. It can be, yes ma'am. Yeah, uh, one proof of identity includes a certified birth certificate or a valid, valid unexpired U.S. passport. passport. Yes ma'am. If you're foreign born, documents from the Department of Homeland Security, proof of your social security number, which could be your original social security card, a 1099 form, a W-2 with a customer's name, address, and social security number, <laughs> as well as your employer's name, address, and identification right. number, two proofs of residency. Yes are also required, that was required anyway, and customers may bring in documents such as utility bills not more than 60 days old. How is this going over? You know, honestly, I think it's going pretty well. Really? I do. I think our biggest, our, our biggest issue so far is the documentation, just what you said. Mm -hmm. I think most people understand the reason why we're doing it, and that is because of the federal guidelines. We're following their guidelines. We're in compliance. Mm -hmm. um, of course, this was all brought about from Real ID. From uh, the Real ID was brought about because of 9/11. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the ability for people to fraudulently obtain driver's licenses, you know, that's a big concern. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing in West Virginia is we're following those federal guidelines. We are creating a new, almost a, you know, just a clean database of people's information. And that's why it's so important to bring in all that documentation. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that you are who you say you are. So people, I think for the most part, our customers understand that aspect. Mm -hmm. I think it's just bringing in the documentation that can be, uh, you know, that can be hard. We really don't ask for any more documentation than what you originally brought in when you first applied for a driver's license or ID card. The difference is most people that apply for their first driver's license or ID card are teenagers. Yes, that's right. And in that in that case, most of them are not married um, or maybe haven't had a name change mm -hmm. or a divorce or you know mm -hmm. some other court-ordered name change. Because I want to get into that. You need to bring name change documents, including a certified marriage certificate or a divorce degree or some sort of court order. If your name has changed at any point in your life through adoption, marriage, divorce, or any other reason, you must bring in name change documents so the DMV can establish a link in your identity back to the certified birth certificate or valid passport. Yes, ma'am. Even if you've been married 60 years, you've got to find that marriage certificate in order to show that you are who you are. That you are who you say you are. That is correct. And again, this is, this is federal guidelines. This is a, a new clean database for us. And, and we understand that and you know, we do get a lot of phone calls about that. Right. Um, I myself got my real ID, my four federal identification card mm -hmm. a couple weeks back and I too had to bring in my social security card, my birth certificate, marriage certificate. Can you get marriage certificates? from the state, they still have those on file somewhere? Go to your county courthouse. Go to okay, the county, county courthouse, courthouse you can whenever, get it from there. 
wherever you were married, yes. And the key for folks to know about the name change documents, a couple things that I want to reiterate. Number one, because we have to have a link in your identity, if you have been married and divorced, uh, let's say with the divorce decree, you uh, didn't go back to your maiden name. Mm -hmm. Then when you get married again, your new certificate will have had your uh, first married name and then the new one. So that's the reason we have to have all that documentation. Now, if you had gone back to your maiden name or, you know, mm -hmm. And, and it could be traced back to the birth certificate, that that would be acceptable. And you would have a court order saying that your name has gone back. Exactly. You know, I knew this was gonna be a big deal when you sent out a uh, news release on behalf of Commissioner Joe Miller saying these changes are coming, they're very intense, they're very extensive, please don't take it out on the DMV staff. <laughs> I, I, I knew this was gonna be a big deal then. All right, what is, it says here over 12,000 for federal identification driver's licenses and ID cards have been issued since the new guidelines went into place January 3rd. Uh, this represents about 36% of the total number of driver's licenses and ID cards issued since the start of the year. What is for federal identification driver's licenses? The four federal identification licenses and ID cards are going to enable our customers to be able to get through security uh, easier um, in the airports. It's going to enable our customers to get into federal buildings a little easier. Um, it's really a convenience, but it's also in, co in the coming years by 2017 maybe pretty much a requirement. I can't speak for exactly what the federal government has in store in a couple years, but um, if you don't have the four federal identification license or ID card, you may be required to bring additional documentation with you to airports or to get into a federal building. So we're trying to uh, be ahead of the game as far as that's concerned. So we do give our customers that option. Uh, the documentation requirements are the same whether you get the four or the not four. If you choose the not for, you leave the DMV regional office that day with your card. Mm -hmm. If you choose the four, you're sent home with a temporary card and you receive your your hard plastic card in, you know, by UPS within usually three weeks, about 15 business days. Would you recommend everybody go for the four federal identification card if they travel, if they're going to a federal building? If they do I mean, tend to travel. Some sort of national travel, ID, it sounds right, like. Right, right. And, and it is certainly the, the push um, nationally to get this. Um, so yeah, I, the price is the same, the fee is the same, whether you get the four or the not four. Again, it's, it's a convenience if you do travel, if you do need access into federal buildings. And yes, you don't get to leave the office Office with it right away, but you are given a temporary license. Um, our law enforcement officials across the state are aware of that temporary license. Is a fingerprint required for the federal ID? No, it's, no, it's still optional, yes. Very interesting. One last issue before I let you go, one before the state legislature, because that was all federal law. Is this going to be the year texting while driving is going to be banned in West Virginia? You know, I hope. I really do. Um, it seems it seems to have some movement. We've got it. Uh, it's through the Senate and it's sitting in House Judiciary right now. But certainly DMV is going to support any type mm -hmm. of legislation that is for the safety of our citizens. Who's against it? Do you know? Who's against not banning texting while driving? You know, I don't. I, I don't, don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, for me, anything safety related, I'm going to be for because I want I want people to live. I, I work for DMV and we just want everybody to be safe. We want the highways to be safe. Natalie Harvey from the Division of Motor Vehicles. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. And here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today and what's coming up in the House of Delegates tomorrow. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 4533, to allow county fire companies and departments to charge reasonable reimbursement fees for personnel and equipment used in performing firefighting services, victim rescue, or cleanup of debris or hazardous materials by department personnel. House Bill 4536, to provide that five unexcused occasions on which a student is late for school may equal one unexcused absence. House Bill 4540, to declare a child's right to nurse. House Bill 4541, to ban the sale of flavored tobacco products. 
Among the bills up for passage in the House tomorrow, House Bill 4087, to extend the moratorium on the regular severance tax on timber until such time as the additional Workers' Compensation Debt Reduction Act tax on the privilege of severing timber expires. Among the bills on second reading, House Bill 4015, creating the Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs within the Governor's Office. House Bill 4299, at the request of the Governor, to permit a County Board of Education to use bus operators regularly employed in a different county to operate their school buses. And House Bill 4330, to provide that driver's licenses may contain information designating the licensee as a person who is honorably discharged from any branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. And here's one more legislative story to pass along to you before we leave. The state Supreme Court is seeking public comment on proposed rules for a business court in West Virginia. The High Court has considered the draft rules for the new court. This is in response to House Bill 4352 that passed the legislature two years ago. The bill was sponsored by House Speaker Rick Thompson. The proposals creating Rule 29 commercial litigation are available on the Supreme Court's website. Comments can be filed in writing to the clerk of the court until May 11th. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Beth Voorhees. Thanks for joining us. Good night.